Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. This is the morning light. Happy New Year. Daily Bible study. <laughs> Woohoo! Yes. It's going to be a good year. It's the beginning of the new year. It's Friday. When it starts, the new year starts out on a Friday. It's going to be a good year. What else could possibly go right? <laughs> Glory. Now, today being Friday, this is the day that uh, we do two things that are very important to us. Number one, we ask you to use your like, share, email button to share, like, share, print, uh, give out the <laughs> day, the morning light Pass it on. Bible study to your friends. Share it with your friends. Tell your friends about the morning light. Uh, we really don't do any promotion of the broadcast other than making the links available and through word of mouth we are now upwards of we're headed into territories of about 20,000 subscribers Glory to, to the broadcast mm -hmm. and the Lord told us when we started doing this that the day would come it would surpass the uh, success uh, of the daily prophetic word and the daily prophetic word reaches out right currently to about 40,000 uh, people uh, we've, we've got some year-end reports on uh, traffic on the website, and we have found that we are reaching monthly about 80,000 people through all the different things that we're doing. Glory to God. That's uh, 80,000 visits uh, to something that we have online every month. Thank you, Father. And many of those come every single day. And many more of those come every single week uh, to the website or to the, through the emails or through the Morning Light broadcast. And, and why do I say that? Well, it leads into the second reason, second thing we do on Fridays. It's all about stewardship. Uh, can you imagine uh, your local church reaching, even a large local church, reaching 80,000 people every month? Many of you, that's probably many times the city that you live in. And so it's an effective uh, ministry. We want to demonstrate, we look at these things because we want to demonstrate that we're good ground. Thank you, Father. And for those of you that, that give, there are people that give and support the ministry um, with great liberality and Thank sacrifice. You, and, and why? Because of large gifts. Yes, there are large gifts that come in, but there's also those in uh, Kenya that give, you know, just three or four dollars. Mm -hmm. And three or four dollars in Kenya, I'm sure, means a whole lot more than three or four dollars in the Western world. And so we don't take it for granted. We're and so grateful. Those of you that partner with us, we are just so absolutely thankful to you. We do not take it for granted what you do for us. And uh, we invite you. You know, a long time ago, the Lord spoke to us about believing for partners and to believe God for 500 partnerships. And uh, just, we really, to, to number that, we don't have a partnership program that can be measured anyway outside of uh, PayPal or if somebody just sends in a gift and said, this is a partnership that I'm, I'm giving. Mm -hmm. But we've got fewer than 200 partners. We have a, a real uh, confidence, our faith set on seeing 500 partners. Now, what do partners make possible? Partners underwrite travel. Mm -hmm. It's not all they do, but one big thing that partners make possible is for us to travel in ministry. Because when we travel in ministry, we do not require, well, we have to have so much money or we're not going. That means we go to Europe and we do a home meeting. <laughs> that means we go out and minister without respect to whether or not we're going to come away with more money than it cost us to get there. Uh, partnerships make that happen. Now, quite frankly, there are times that we've done that. We've gone into group meetings of fewer than five people and come out with far more uh, uh, than sometimes we've gotten in groups of hundreds. <laughs> it's just an unusual thing that happens. That is good. But my point being that you're giving. And, and it's very interesting because today's Friday, and one of the things that this is, talks about in our chapter today, Second Chronicles 31, it talks about giving. Now, remember what I've always said. 
The narrative drives the experience. <laughs> and I've seen this happen more than once sure. since we've been doing this. That Friday would roll around and the chapter that we're dealing with addresses the issue of giving. Now, how is it that this chapter we're studying addresses something we're going through? Because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And so as we're studying the word of God, it's a whole lot more than go study a scripture on such and such if you want to receive this or that. You need to understand there's something cosmic that takes place when you do what Paul told Timothy, give attention to reading. You hitch up to a narrative and you begin to be a people of the book in, in ways that are, that are, the only way you can quantify it is from a, a perspective of mysticism. You begin to see you're walking this out. That's why we're going to speed read through the book of Job. <laughs> no, so, <we're> not. <laughs> so let's just go ahead and begin in Second Chronicles 31. Hezekiah continues the revival. In this chapter, Hezekiah makes provision for reforms and revival that were instituted in his reign to continue and spread throughout Judah and the northern kingdom as well. Temple sacrifice and service were provided for out of Hezekiah's own resources. He invites the people to give and then he participates, to, he invites people to give and to participate in supporting the Levites. The idols and the groves are turned down, torn down, not just in the high places, but throughout Judah and Israel. Reforms continue and the heart of the people follow the example set by Hezekiah. And I love the very last uh, three words. Uh, and they prospered. It's all this stuff they've been doing for three chapters. Hezekiah came to the throne, and for three chapters, he's been dealing with problems, <laughs> reinstituting, cleaning up, get the filthiness out of the temple, get the Levites prepared, invite the people, put up with the people that got offended because he invited them, <laughs> deal with this, deal with that. Sanctify the priests. Make provision for things to, and then they prosper. Glory. You need to understand, we're waiting to be doused with the magic touch. But God wants to induce us or induct us into a process. Mm -hmm. And you need to go back and read Second Chronicles 29, 30, and 31, and you will see a process. This is this <laughs> Jesus sums sums up Second Chronicles 29, 30, and 31 in Matthew 6, 33. He says, It's simple, fellas. Seek first the kingdom, mm -hmm. and all things will be added. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very powerful, powerful uh, study that we uh, have been taking and uh, partaking of in the last three chapters, particularly. So, <clears throat> Second Chronicles 31, verses 1 through 6 to begin with. Okay. Now, when all this was finished, all Israel that were present went out into the cities of Judah and break the images in pieces and cut down the groves and threw down the high places and the altars out of all Judah and Benjamin and Ephraim also and Manasseh until they had utterly destroyed them all. Then all the children of Israel returned, every man to his possession, into their own cities. And Hezekiah appointed the courses of the priests and the Levites after their courses, every man according to his service, the priests and the Levites, for burnt offerings and for peace offerings, to minister and to give thanks and praise in the gates of the tents of the Lord. He appointed also the king's portion of his substance for the burnt offerings, to wit, for the morning and the evening burnt offerings, and the burnt offerings for the Sabbaths, and for the new moons, and for the set feasts, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Moreover, he commanded that the people dwelt, that dwelt in Jerusalem to give the portion of the priests <clears throat> and the Levites, that, if they might, that they might be encouraged in the law of the Lord. And as soon as the commandment came abroad, the children of Israel brought in abundance of the first fruits of corn, wine, and oil, and honey, and all of the increase of the field. And the tithe of all things brought they in abundantly. And concerning the children of Israel and Judah that dwelt in the cities of Judah, they also brought up, brought in the tithe of oxen and sheep, and the tithe of holy, the holy things, which were consecrated unto the Lord their God and laid them by heaps. So in chapter 29, Hezekiah repaired the temple of God, whose door had been sealed off by his father Ahaz. Notice that Hezekiah was not one of these people say, it was good enough for daddy, it's good enough for me. Mm -hmm. I've seen people uh, immersed in religious tradition 
that makes the word of God of none effect. And they will admit that it's contrary to the word of God, but they say, well, it's always been done that way, and that's how we're going to do it. Hezekiah did not do that. In chapter 30, after reconstituting the sacrifices, he invites the whole of the 12 tribes of Israel to come and to celebrate the Passover. And in this chapter, after great rejoicing in the city of Jerusalem and a powerful visitation of God, Hezekiah sets in motion now, in this chapter, what is intended to promote the continuation of the reforms and celebration of worship as God established by Moses in the law centuries ago. Up to this point, Hezekiah has gone further. And you need to make note of this. This is a high watermark. You know, 200 years or 100 years after Hezekiah's reign, people would be looking back on Hezekiah's day like we look back on Azusa Street or the 1950s healing revivals. This was a high watermark of the things of God uh, in their day. Uh, Hezekiah has gone further in reform and accountability to the word of God than any of his predecessors since Solomon. And notice that this is the king. This is the rule. If you want to find secularism uh, dominating and pushing God uh, out of the marketplace, just look in the area of politics. I mean, a politician, that is a big deal. Uh, every politician, whether he's an atheist or whatever he believes, they know that in the United States, you don't get elected unless you say Jesus. <laughs> you know, but yet that's about all there is to it. You know, that... They, they ver they're very careful because if they show a genuine fidelity to God and piety toward the word of God, they are ripped apart by the wolves of the media. But here this king is nakedly and without shame saying, we're going to do this God's way. So Hezekiah, no doubt, he not only wants to, isn't this great, you know, I, we just had... Uh, a series of revival meetings. We weren't directly participating in it, but there was a series of revival meetings in Branson, and it's the Branson outbreak, and it's the Branson outpouring, and people were coming, and thousands of people were packing in to where this these meetings were be, being held. But uh, but now it's kind of crested, and it's like almost like the street sweepers come in, let's clean this mess up, like they're doing at Times Square today. Wasn't that great? But we don't want to do we don't want to do that all year long. We don't want to drop the ball every night at Times Square. We just want to do it, you know, once in a year, mm -hmm. because we have this idea of visitation. Hezekiah says, no, we want to do this on an ongoing basis. We don't just want visitation. We want habitation. habitation. That's what we want. So, uh, the purpose of God is not just for us to have seasons of reform or revival. The purpose of God is, see, I went to church, uh, this church in Sulphur, Louisiana one time, and it was one of the most powerful church services I'd ever been in. And there were like maybe not even 100 people there. And I wasn't the pastor. They didn't belong to my denomination. And I walked in, and it was awesome. I mean, it was everything but people levitating, manifestations of fire, glory, gold teeth, gold fillings, you mm -hmm. know, whatever you want to say. It was just outrageous. And yet, all the time, God was like, he was like, tapping me on the shoulder and I'm like God what is your problem <laughs> you're having a perfectly good church service here you know what what is it that you don't like about this he says my problem is they just want to have this every once in a while I want them to walk in this as an abiding testimony 24 7 mm -hmm. I want them to have more than visitation I want to have habitation they want to do this on a schedule mm -hmm. he said but I want to be this on the inside of them at all times and so, see, God doesn't want you to, uh, the purpose of God is not for you to ride a roller coaster of spiritual ups and downs. He doesn't want you to experience life in Christ as a series of just simply sinning and being forgiven. God wants more than to visit you in an outpouring once in a while. The heart of God is to come into your life in an abiding habitation. He didn't come into the earth. Listen, Jesus did not die to establish religious culture or infrastructure. We had a perfectly good re, uh, religious system before Jesus came. In fact, Judaism did religion better than Christianity does religion. Hmm. Judaism did religion for 2,000 years very effectively. They Judaism were much better at being religious than Christians are. Not to say Christianity is not religious because it is. But we had a perfectly good religious system. We did not need Jesus to come and die 
to foster or to further religious institutions or religious culture. Jesus did not die to put a building on every street corner with a steeple on top. Amen. The heart of God is to find his abiding place inside the yielded human heart. That is why the repeated declaration of the New Testament is that we in our persons are the temple of God and there he not only visits, but he chooses to abide. Now, at the end of an extended season of Passover, this was yesterday's chapter, Hezekiah sends the people home. See, he's saying, now go home. I want you to implement in your personal life the reforms I've initiated in Ju Jerusalem. It's like we're, they're finishing up the one thing here at uh, International House of Prayer. Well, God wants them to go home, take this home with you, and don't just have one thing in Grandview, Missouri. We want you to have one thing every day of the world until Jesus comes. Amen. We want you to walk in habitation and not visitation. Thank you, Lord. He said, you go home and, and institute these reforms. You see Hezekiah cleaned up the city, cleaned up Jerusalem, cleaned up the temple. He says, now you go home and do this in your jurisdiction. And so notice what they did. They returned to the cities of Judah and Ephraim and Manasseh and Benjamin, and they destroyed the idols and pulled down the altars to Baal. Now notice, they utterly destroyed the idols of Ephraim and Manasseh. But if you look at the previous chapter that we studied yesterday, you will remember that Ephraim and Manasseh scorned Hezekiah's invitation to come to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So it's like your next door neighbor. God's pouring out his spirit. Uh, the, the glory cloud is visible and uh, miracles are taking place and angels are appearing and God's really moving and you invite your neighbor and he just laughs at you, you religious fool. I'm not about to come to your stupid church. Why would I participate in that silliness? And then, now this is what this is what they did. They were scorned, but then the revival takes place, and the people that didn't scorn go back. And on the way back, it would be like you and I stopping at our neighbor's house and saying, we're walking in without knocking and saying, now things are going to be a little different around here. And you give me that idol, I'm taking that to the dumpster. You didn't come to the meeting, but I'm here to give you the benefits of it, no matter what. Can you imagine? That's why churches need to have a bail fund equivalent uh, to their building fund. See, they destroy the idols and pull down the altars in Ephraim and Manasseh, even though Ephraim and Manasseh scorned Hezekiah's invitation to come to Jerusalem. So again, it's equivalent to you going home from church and walking into your neighbor's house and saying, there's going to be some changes around here. <laughs> Just try doing that walk into your walk into your children's house that you let stay home from church and see what happens. <laughs> Go in and pull down their idols Yikes. and see what happens. <laughs> That's war. They were doing it with perfect strangers. See, and notice, however, the interesting thing is, is that these tribes, for the first time, Ephraim kept their mouth shut. How many of you remember, we've been studying this for two years now, how mouthy Ephraim was. Mm -hmm. Ephraim always opted out of what God was doing. They were the largest tribe of the 12 tribes, and they always opted out. And then after it was all over with, they'd get all mouthy. This is the first, no, rec, uh, this is the first uh, instance that I know of that we've studied where Ephraim keeps its mouth shut. And here these tribesmen are going in there and tearing down their idols. And remember their idols were the houses of prostitution where they worshiped through ritual, sexual ceremony and so forth. And, they, and here their neighbors are coming in who went to the revival that they scorned in Jerusalem and they're coming back through on their way home and, and they're tearing down their idols. And for once, Ephraim keeps their mouth shut. See, when God is doing something as conspicuous as what took place in Jerusalem, even those who declined to participate will be silenced and subdued. You're not going to shut them up through politics. Mm -hmm. You're not going to shut them up uh, by dropping bombs on them. You're not going to shut them up by putting drones on top of their cities and killing everybody that don't do what you think they ought to be doing. But the glory of God, when it flows, will silence the mockers. Amen. See, in order to foster the continuation of worship of Jehovah, the king, what does the king do? He apportions out of his own substance daily sacrifice and offering. He also provided for the daily maintenance of the needs of the Levites, setting the example of giving. 
before anybody gave into this revival, Hezekiah was giving into the revival. Mm -hmm. You need to think about that. That's what the Bible says. When Paul made this statement, he said that children don't lay up for the needs of the fathers. The fathers lay up for the needs of the children. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. If you're a pastor, if you're a leader, and if you're a believer, you're a leader because you're a king and a priest. So look yourself in the mirror, ladies, get out your compact and say, I'm a leader. Leaders are supposed to set the example of giving. They're not providing for you, you're providing for them. How does that work? In a meeting recently, we had an experience where, where we determined we were going to demonstrate in a prophetic act how an apostolic move, we said 2014, 2015 would be the year of the apostle. And so God said 2016 is a year of accountability to the apostolic. Amen. And if we're going to demonstrate what being an apostolic father is all about, you're going to have to know what it is to be a one that uh, uh, not the children laying up for the needs of the fathers, but the fathers laying up for the needs of the children. So what Kitty and I did is we took a certain amount of money. It was $4,000. Divided. And we divided it up yeah. in envelopes of 50. And we determined that we were going to give that money out to a registered group of people who came into our meetings. We didn't tell them we were going to do it. No. And we didn't do it the night of our biggest meeting. No. You know, a lot of times you say, say you're going to do something like that and you get a mixed multitude. We didn't tell anybody. No. And, uh, and so in the second service... We taught on this, this understanding about how money moves by the Spirit and that the children don't lay up for the needs of the fathers. The fathers lay up for the needs of the children. And then we brought out the envelopes. And the interesting thing was that in this meeting, there were half the number of people that we had made provision for. And so instead of giving everybody in the room $50, we gave everybody in the room $100. Now, it's not just throwing money out of a window like they do on Times Square oh, in no. January. Oh, no, no, it's about teaching people that money moves by the Spirit. God gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Yes, there were some mixed multitude there that stuck that money in their pocket and laughed us to scorn and walked out and never came back. But that's not the point. What God was doing was something holy and something prophetic. It was not a stunt. And the amazing thing was, we asked God to multiply the money, and he did it by bringing only half the people that we had uh, invited. Remember the verse of scripture about invited? Oh, I got something else to do? Oh, okay then. Alrighty. <laughs> but choices have consequences. And so the ones that did come got a double portion. And we just realized this yesterday. God multiplied the loaves and the fishes. Amen. And Tim Fox prophesied to us a few months ago about the loaves and the fishes. And that's what we taught on about when you give the Lord your little lunch, you get the thousandfold return. The Amen. little boy gave five loaves, or five loaves and five fishes, or two fishes, yeah. and it multiplied to 5,000. There is a thousandfold return God. in God. Amen. And the people were practicing hearing the voice of God. Remember all the time how Russ teaches it, a prophet is uh, unjust if he only tells you what God's saying and doesn't teach you how to hear. So we had them be quiet for 20 minutes and, and listen to the voice of God and do just what the Spirit of God said. And can I tell you, now when you do something like that, you know, you could just about forget the meeting being a profitable. You, you're you're going to say this is one of those meetings that we don't expect in the offerings that were taken for it to be uh, profitable. Well, let me tell you something. We have had a, an abundance over and above that which we sacrificed in a prophetic act, Amen. setting the example. Amen. Leaders are to set the example of giving. Mm -hmm. And we, set, we chose by the word of the Lord, not to prove a point. Again, the Lord had me get up at a certain point and say, this is not a stunt. Come on. This is something that God told us to do. And this is what Hezekiah did out of his own uh, resources, out of his own provisions, he provides. Now, uh, and, what, and after an setting the example of giving and supporting the work of the Lord, Hezekiah sends out command to the people to follow in his example. And notice the point. He said, why are they giving? To be, so that the Levites would be encouraged in the law of the Lord. If there's one thing I know those people received in that meeting, it was encouragement. Amen. 
They came away from there encouraged. They were weeping. They were saying, I've never been in something like this before. Papa Don said in 48 years of ministry, he'd never in his life been in anything like that because it was orchestrated by the Spirit of by God. By the Holy Ghost. And he's always new. He's always doing something new and wonderful. See, it's not about, well, God, God only takes care of your needs. He won't take care of your wants. Wrong. No, you don't understand. It's not about needs or wants. It's about God wanting to encourage his people. Amen. See, what is the purpose of giving? It's more than just making sure the lights are on at the church or that the church mortgage is paid. It's about encouraging men and women who serve in the purposes of God. See, there's a school of thought. Let's talk about this for a minute. There's a school of thought today that says we shouldn't have full-time ministers. I've run into a lot of people that have deep scorn and despising for anybody that's full-time in the ministry, as though that's illegitimate and ungodly. Many suggest today that if a minister works full-time in his ministry and is paid for doing so, that somehow that is a compromise or a wrong thing. I know people that, that wear, they, they minister, and they don't take offerings, and they wear that as a badge of religious contempt for anybody who would dare to receive an offering. Well, you'd have trouble with Jesus because Jesus received offerings. And Jesus was supported, and he was supported by women of all things. See, this is a contradiction by the examples given to us here in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Listen to what Paul said. I saw something in this verse today I'd never seen before. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. Let the elders that rule be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. Now, do you realize what he's saying? Now, if you look at it in the context, the honor that he's talking about is talking about people that, that lead in the body of Christ being paid for doing so. He says the ones that, that the elders that rule be counted worthy of double honor. That means you have a board of elders. He's suggesting that everybody gets paid. He said particularly those who labor or are full time in laboring in the word and doctrine, he says they get double pay. Mm -hmm. What this tells us is that those who lead in the church were paid for doing so. The honor spoken of is talking about remuneration of elders. The interesting thing is, see, my father did that in the, the last church that he pastored. He received a sizable salary, and he didn't take any of it because he didn't need it. He was in business. He didn't need the money. He took it, and he apportioned it and divided it out to all the ministers in the church. And some of them were scandalized because they didn't want to be blessed. They wanted to criticize the preacher because of all the money he was getting, and the preacher was taking the money and giving it to them, and they were utterly scandalized. They could not handle that. The interesting thing is that the elders who worked at what we would call a secular job, this scripture implies they were paid for carrying out ministry duties. And that those who labored at what we would call full-time ministry, they were paid double. So let me ask you a question. What should your pastor be paid? What is the appropriate pay for a pastor? Take the average income. If a, if a elder that rules and labors full-time in the word is to be paid double honor, then you take the average income per capita in your church and double it. In other words, you take up how much does everybody make by the number of people, wage earners in your church. You divide that total figure by the number of the people earning a living in your church and then double it. That's, what you, that's, that's where your pastor's baseline salary begins. Mm. Can you handle that? Mm. You can pay more than that if you want to. See, that's, uh, that's what Paul's telling Timothy, that, that full-time elders should be paid double. Why? Do they need it? Or we just want to pay him what he needs? No, you want to encourage him. You want to pay him until he gets encouraged. Because if he's not encouraged, how's he going to encourage you? Come on now. Oh, it's not about the money. Yes, it is. The Bible itself says that money answers all things and wisdom answers all things. But the excellency of knowledge is wisdom gives life to those that find it. Mm -hmm. And we need to realize that. people get Sometimes people get really super spiritual about old we don't want to talk about money, Brother Walden. And they're broke. Their kids are going to community college, driving used cars. They're shopping at Walmart. They're going to the bargain basement. But yet they're so holy about money and they're living. They're the worst possible example of being blessed. Their life is anything but abundant. 
if you just absolutely don't want to receive the money, then do it as a testimony to God because Jesus came that you might have life and life more abundantly. Amen. And if your life does not represent life and life more abundantly, then you're a bad testimony. We want you to walk in the blessing. God wants you to walk in the blessing, and he has the ways and means committed to make it happen. And look at somebody and say, I'm on my way to somewhere. I'm on my way to somewhere. <laughs> You're somewhere in your future, and you look much better than you look right now. God bless Kim Clement. <laughs> when Hezekiah gave command, now he, Hezekiah set the example. Then he said, now come on, y'all do likewise. And they weren't doing so grudgingly. There was no, and notice that it doesn't talk about tithe until later, you know. Sometimes pastors, they want to lead with the obligation. You're robbing, you're not doing this, you're robbing God. Oh, man, that represents such a lack of confidence in the people. You don't get it. If, Pastor, if you are beating people over the head with the tithe, you so are not getting what God's people are capable of. We don't beat the sheep, we feed the sheep. Hezekiah brought that up. Matter of fact, Hezekiah didn't bring it up at all. It was just the outworking, almost the afterglow of all the other giving. Oh, yeah, let's not forget. 10%, oh, yeah, we'll gladly do that. So much so you're going to see that they didn't have offering bags. They had offering heaps. And we're going to get to that in just a minute. So they started giving and blessing the Levites with corn and wine and oil, and only later in verse 6 was the tithe mentioned. Even under the law, when people were in love with God, they were far more interested in giving just the 10% solution. I don't want 10% of anything God has for me. Amen. I want it all. That's why, if you're going to be honest with the, the New Testament, the New Testament, when Jesus talked about money, he only talked about the tithe to demonstrate hypocrisy. He said, forsake all, give all, render up all. And he didn't say give it to the church. He said, give it to the poor and then come follow me. And guess what? I don't think they were broke. No. They weren't. And we can demonstrate that, and I don't have time to go into it. See, Jesus said, whenever you forsake all, see, what What did, I think it was Peter said, well, we've forsaken all. That's right, and guess what? You're going to walk in the hundredfold return now and when you get to heaven. What happens when you forsake all? So let's, let's get past this 10% solution as though we're achieving something. That's right. We need to go way out beyond that so we can walk in the hundredfold return and even experience that thousandfold return we talked about later. I heard uh, a lady preacher I respect say that and I rejected it. I'm like, the thousandfold return sounds good, but I don't know where that is in the Bible. <laughs> so they want you to give $4,000 away in this meeting. And by the way, that's the, what the thousandfold return is based on when you give like that. Amen. So we gave God our little lunch. Uh, for the, let me tell you something. $4,000 means to us what it means to you. That's right. <laughs> so we gave him our little lunch. He's multiplying it already. And he's been multiplying back. Praise We've seen God. it supernatural. It happens every time. Thank you, Lord. As a prophetic act. Uh, so giving is to be from the heart. People who complain about giving to ministry do not have their hearts invested in the things of God. Where your heart is, there will your treasure be also. Find a church or ministry. See, just because somebody's not uh, thrilled to give into your ministry doesn't mean they couldn't be thrilled to give into somebody else's ministry. If Russ Walden said sit down and write a check for $1,000, well, someone may or may not be motivated to do it, but if Chuck Smith did it, they'd write 2000 If Joel Osteen did it, they'd write 2000 now, I'm not, I'm not criticizing those ministers. I'm just making a point. Don't judge people and say blah, 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 blah about them just because they're not inspired by your ministry. So I tell people all the time when I talk like this, I said, I'm not after your money. This is not where Russ Walden asks for your credit card number. Mm -hmm. And if I don't inspire you, go find someone who does because the important right. thing is to find your inspiration. Amen. You know, people get around us and they find out they're just not inspired by us. They make they make these commitments. Oh, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. But come to find out, they're not going to do it. And then they feel condemned, and they try to find something wrong. And when you get condemned, oh, I'm not giving to that church. Look at what they're doing. They didn't need to get that new keyboard. They didn't need to have that lighting system installed. And we don't need those smoke machines during the worship service. Well, I got it. You know, that's one of my bones to pick. But, <laughs> but the point is that it's not so much that people are small-minded. They need to go out and find ministry that does motivate them. 
They need to go out and find someone that they are motivated to give. I so appreciate the widow with the two mites. She cast into the treasury that Jesus was looking into. And guess what? She wasn't giving to anybody's need. She was given to the treasury of the ministry that crucified Jesus a few months later. Yeah. But she gave where God told her to. Learn to give where God tells you to. Find a church or ministry or anointing that inspires you to give and get under it and support it joyfully and sacrificially. Do not allow a small-minded heart to rob you or hold you captive to the spirit of poverty that stalks all those who have a negative attitude about giving. It's true. If you read verse 7 through 11. Verse 7, in the third month, they began to lay the foundation of the heaps and finish them in the seventh month. When Hezekiah and the princes came and saw the heaps, they blessed the Lord and his people Israel. Mm -hmm. Then Hezekiah questioned with the priests and the Levites concerning the heaps. And Azariah, the chief priest of the house of... Now, now let's back up because I would talk so much. Look back at verse 6. What are the heaps? It's talking about all the people bringing in and laid them by heaps. All of a sudden, they got heaps. What's these heaps to deal with? Okay, go ahead. Bigger than a teaspoonful. And Azariah, the chief priest of the house of Zadok, answered him and said, Since the people began to bring the offerings into the house of the Lord, we have had enough to eat and have plenty left plenty. For the Lord hath blessed his people, and that which is left is this great store. Then Hezekiah commanded um, to prepare chambers in the house of the Lord, and they prepared them. So they have these heaps, and in the third month they're laying the foundation of the heaps. In other words... They had to buttress the foundation of the temple because of the weight of the heaps. Are you listening? Can you imagine having the deacons down in the basement of the church putting up four by fours underneath the sanctuary where the offerings kept because the offerings are coming in such heaps it's in danger of collapsing the building. <laughs> Glory. Hello. In Hezekiah's day, the people gave so much that the substance was not in small little receptacles that were whisked out of sight by the secretaries. They gave until there were massive heaps in substance, so much so they had to build and rearrange just to physically deal with the abundance that was coming in. Mm -hmm. Just to deal with it. And then, so in the, the builders came in in the third month and began to build. It took four months to renovate and enlarge and build storage and receptacles long, large enough to accommodate the massive amounts that were being given to the temple and to the Levites. Wow. Can you imagine having a building program in your church that would take four months just to come up with the physical containment for the massive dimensions of the offerings being given and what was taking place? Glory. God wants us to be givers. God wants us to be willing to bless and benefit, not just the infrastructure needed for our worship, but for our ministers and our leaders as well, so that your pastor serves without distraction or impediment. Amen. Where do you give? Where's your accountability? Where's your accountability? Who's feeding you? When God looks at you, who does he expect you to be listening to? Who are you sitting under? Where is your accountability? Who is feeding you? Whoever feeds you the word of God and provides context and foundation for your testimony as a believer, that's where your giving should be. And usually it's more than one place. I've always said, um, I heard it one time, it stuck with me. If you eat down at McDonald's, you don't pay your bill at Taco Bell. You pay where you're fed. Whoever's feeding you and enriching your life is where you should be pouring your substance. Now that may be very different from just dumping 10% in the plate. That may be regularly handing your mentor, whether he's a recognized minister or not, a gift card for the big box store or a restaurant. That may mean you don't go out to dinner unless you're taking your elder and his family along to enjoy a dinner out as well. There are people that, that uh, speak into our life that Kitty and I respect because of who they are in God and we barely go out to eat unless we're picking up the phone and calling that couple up mm -hmm. and saying, come on, let's have something. That may be if we pay somebody to come cut our grass, we're going to say, now here, go to this address and cut their grass. Amen. Thank you, Lord. See, it's having a heart to give. Oh, I can't afford that. That's why. That's why you can't afford that, my brother and my sister. 
That means when you pay your mortgage, you sit down and you write a check for that one's mortgage. What you make happen for others, God will make happen for you. That means when you sit down and you write your check to pay your bills, you sit down and write a check to pay mom and daddy's bills. That's a whole other conversation. Amen, Brother Walden. Oh, I can't do that. I understand you can't do that. That's why. You can start. <laughs> just start. You know. You're just not, man, you don't put your pants on like I do, Brother Walden. You don't live in the world. Yes, I implemented do. this stuff when I was homeless, folks, <laughs> living out of my car. And God began to do some things. Amen. <laughs> because a prophet stood us up in a meeting and said, money moves by the Spirit. <laughs> That's what he said. See, that may mean carving out large portions of your family budget to give away from yourself, Pastor. Yes. You know, Pastor takes his tithe check in his right hand, hands it to his left hand, and says, let's be thankful for the offering. Quit doing that. That's, hypo that's hypocrisy. You, give away you stop yourself. doing that. Yeah. And you stop doing that now. You start finding those who blessed you, those who ministered to you. I don't care if you have outgrown them. You go go dump your bank account into that preacher that you've totally outgrown, but he was your spiritual daddy, and he did a good work for you when you were young in the Lord. You go look him up. I don't care if you have to hire a private investigator to find him. You <laughs> empty your bank account to be a blessing Amen. to him. <laughs> See that? Carving out large portions of your own personal budget to give away from you for the benefit and the blessing of those who labor in the word over your life. We ignore these questions to our own hurt. And yet, you are the only one who can answer the call to give. It isn't about manipulation or guilt or fear-mongering. Give willingly. Give liberally. Give expansively. Until the, in, till the income, until the income of the economy, in order to make good on his promise, God has to enlarge the economy of the nation just to make good on what he promises you would do. Do you realize God will make a nation fat just to make good on his promise because he's not a liar? Right. And when the people of God, you want to solve the problems in the economy in your nation? Let the people of God come together and begin to give, as I'm describing, and he will move heaven and earth. Amen. To cre he will create an economy that the transfer of the wealth might be come into your coffers. Yes, Father. Do it, God. Do it, God. Let us hear you gladly. Give expansively until money in your life begins to move by the Spirit. And you have enough to meet your need, your own need, and plenty left over to sacrificially give into the work of God. You cannot say you believe in the Bible and trust God if we are not giving and giving liberally without complaint into the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to read some of these verses because i got oh. names. I'm going to give you a break. Thank you, honey bunny. Verse 12. They brought in the offerings and the tithes and the dedicated things faithfully, over which was... Coniah, the Levite, ruler, and Shimei, his brother, was next, and Jehiel, and Azaziah, and Nahab, and Asahel, and Jeremoth, and Josabad, and Eliel, and Ishmaiah, and Mahath, and Benaiah, overseers under the hand of Coniah, and Shimei, his brother. Do you realize these are, these are the treasures? Mm -hmm. These are the people they had to hire all these people to handle the heaps. <laughs> And Cory, the son of Imna, the Levite, the porter toward the east, was over the freewill offerings to distribute the oblations of the Lord. They hired a guy just to hand out, you know, we, we do that in our meetings. We have, a, we have a handful of envelopes. We go into any of the meetings that we do, and there's a handful of envelopes to give out. I know a lot, you know, a lot of them are volunteers and different ones, but even people that volunteer. We go to Denise, we say, here's the envelopes, make sure you give these out, because we don't have time to do it. Right. We have to hire somebody to do the distribution, and this is what was happening here. There was somebody there just to make sure it all got distributed, and next to him were Eden and Menahem and Jeshua and Shemaiah and Amariah and Shechaniah in the cities of the priests in their set office to give. There were people, and what's my job? Oh, my job is to give to the brethren, to give to the brethren by courses as well as to the great or the small. They were giving so much they had to hire, looks like about six guys, just to hand out the offerings. Glory. <laughs> in the cities of the priests and in their set uh, and in their set uh, lost my place office verse 16 beside the genealogy of the males three years and upward 
they were giving so much, they were giving offerings to three-year-olds. My goodness. <laughs> Even unto everyone that entered into the house of the Lord, his daily portion for their service and their charges and their courses. Can you imagine what happens if the deacon board decides they're going to put the pastor's three-year-old son on salary? You would have open revolt in the, in, in the people. In that giving that we did in the meeting that got instructed, we had an eight-year-old little girl, and she poured her resources. She prayed. She poured the resources of her $100 into people's lives and came back with almost as much as she gave away before the day was done. <laughs> both to verse 17, both to the genealogy by the house of their fathers and the Levites from 20 years old and upward in their charges by their courses and to the genealogy of all their little ones, their wives, their sons, their daughters. In other words, they were so intent on giving. Well, if the Lord brings somebody by. How many of you done this? Lord, if you'll tell me, I'll give a thousand dollars. You just tell. Have that preacher. I've had people do this. It broke my heart. Uh, they would come. Uh, well, I was going to give you a thousand dollars, Brother Walden. And I asked the Lord if, if he wanted me to give you that thousand dollars, he would tell you to come ask me for it. You've got to be kidding. How despicable. That is, these people were wanting to give so much that they sat down and said, okay, God told me to bless your family. I've, ha I've hired a genealogist who's going to research your family tree just to make sure I get it done. Wow. Wow. Awesome. So the next time you feel that, that religious devil get on you. In other words, you're looking for uh, to make somebody else, the guy you're supposed to be giving to, to let you off the hook and not feeling guilty about giving what God told you to give. Oh, Lord, okay, give me a confirmation. If you want me to give that $1,000, then you tell that person to come over here and tell me, I, I know God told you to give me $1,000. No, but... no preacher that has any fear of God will ever do that, and I know a lot of them that will. There is no way... If an angel appeared to me and said, you were supposed to give us $1,000, I would not come ask you. Got to hear it from the Father. No, you got to do what God said do. You got to give with a willing heart. Amen. The first time he <laughs> says it is better. And so they gave but to the sons of the Levites in the fields of the suburbs that went into the suburbs, that went into the cities, the men that were expressed my name to give portions to all the males and to all the priests and to all that were reckoned by genealogies. They were doing genealogical research to find out who they should be giving to. Thank you. And so saying, oh, well, just they come up, and if they don't come get it, then we just won't give it to them. No, they were seeking them out. And thus did Hezekiah throughout all Judah and wrought that which was good and right and true before the Lord is God. And in every work that Hezekiah did in the service of the house of God and the law and the commandments to seek God, he did it with all of his heart in my favorite two words in this chapter, and, uh, and prospered. Amen. <laughs> so after the giving commenced and it was accommodated, I, I counted 19 men appointed to manage the resources. Can you imagine needing not just one, but 19 treasures mm -hmm. in church just to handle the magnitude of what was coming in? Most churches barely manage to have a full-time pastor and maybe a part-time secretary. Man, I've seen people, I've seen worldwide ministries, and they have personal assistants paying them $10 an hour. Wow. We better be thinking about that. We need to pay people what's right. We need to pay people more than just minimum wage. After the giving commenced, and was accommodated. Hezekiah set all this process in motion for the purpose of bringing, just bringing in the money for the purpose, amazing what you say under the anointing, but for the purpose of bringing in money and the purpose of provoking the continual, the continuation of the visitation of God that had been rained down upon the people in Jerusalem and the surrounding tribal lands. His testimony was that he did right and that which was good and true in the sight of the Lord is God. He started the work and he brought it to completion. He implemented the law of Moses and restored honor for the commandments of God. He sought God and did so much with all of his heart in his testimony that he prospered. God is no respecter of persons. You say, well, that was Hezekiah. God's no respecter of persons. He didn't love Hezekiah more than he loves you. He did bless Hezekiah in the Old Testament. He will not bless Hezekiah and yet refuse to bless you in the New Covenant. God is no respecter of persons, but he is a respecter of faith. Listen to me. If we do with our faith 
what Hezekiah did with his faith, we will see the same results. So, Father, we thank you for our Bible study today. Yes. We thank you, Lord, that the narrative drives the experience. Yes. And that you said you gave us these chapters, not just as history, you gave them to instruct and teach us in the way that we should go. You gave them to show us upon whom the ends of the age have come. This is what they did in a temple that was just a faint shadow cast by the substance of what you said in the New Testament you put on the inside of us. Lord, I pray you would show us the substance of this shadow today and what it looks like. Yes, Lord. That you would show us, that you would teach us, that you would, that God, that that you would show us what the heaps look like in our life. Show us what the heaps look like in your temple today, Father God. Lord, we hear for now decades we've heard preachers talk about the transfer of the wealth, but yet, honestly, Lord, for the most part, it hasn't come. But I believe, Lord God, that it starts, you come alongside, you want us to cooperate with your process. Show us how, Lord God, to so cooperate with your process, not being manipulated by men, but listening to the voice of the Spirit and allowing our money to begin to move by the Spirit. Because, Lord, you didn't just talk about 10%. When you talked about money, you talked about give all, sell all, first to the poor and then to the work of God. And Lord, by that, by that, when that happened, when the economy and the nation failed, the children of God were not in debt. They were, they were provided for. All their debts were paid so that they could go into the harvest. All their homes were paid off. All their needs were met so that they were free to go into the harvest. Thank you, Father. God, I believe you will change the economy of a nation to make good on your word to the people of God. When we And we will begin to see. We will see the heaps. The heaps. Lord, we call forth the heaps. Yes, Let the heaps Let come, come into the temple of God. Let the heaps be made manifest. Let the king come. Like Hezekiah came, he said, what are these heaps? Mm -hmm. Let the king come into our temple and say, what are these heaps? And we say, oh, King Jesus, this is what the people are giving. Let the heaps come. Let poverty be broken and poverty be... And Lord, let repentance come. Those that need to change their attitude, those that have had that dollar demon on their case and they've had an attitude about money that has hindered them and hindered their blessing, I pray you just help them gently, sweetly, just to, make, just to flip the switch and make the adjustment. God, we call forth your goodness, your goodness upon your men, and on your women. Let apostolic leadership be shown as we step forward and we begin to move forward in the things that you've called us to do, even in this area, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We just absolutely love you. We hope you have a great, great New Year's Day. And a, and a wonderful weekend.